without further ado, we're going to uh, lead it off with John Beck, who is the executive director of the National Center for Autonomous Technologies and the principal investigator for N the NCAT and SF Center. He's going to lead it off with our opening remarks and our overview of service learning and our introduction to our panel. So John, the floor is all yours. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction. Thank you to the Transportation Center of Excellence for setting up this webinar uh, today. Specifically, Casti has done a tremendous job in coordinating the speakers who are going to be providing their experience and stories as it relates to service learning. And I, I really appreciate all the work that's gone into getting this set up. Again, as Chris said, uh, my name is John Beck. I'm the executive director for the National Center for Autonomous Technologies, also known as NCAT. NCAT is funded through the National Science Foundation, NSF ATE program, ATE standing for Advanced Technological Education. Uh, the NSF ATE program is specifically focused and the only NSF program that I know is specifically focused on two-year technical education. And I think uh, the majority of this audience is probably involved in career and technical education, whether it be at the high school level or at the college level. And you're familiar with some of the challenges that exist in maintaining cutting edge technology in the classrooms, keeping pace with industry advancements as it relates to that cutting edge technology, and making sure that our students are prepared with current and relevant skills so that they can hit the ground running as they enter into the highly skilled technical workforce. And really, that's why I think today's conversation is so important. As we talk about service learning, um, I think service learning really helps to bridge the gap between educational organizations and industry partners and leads to a lot of tremendously beneficial things to enhance the classroom and really enhance the skills of our students out of the programs as they enter into the workforce. Um, NCAT is housed at Northland Community and Technical College, which is located in Northwest Minnesota. And some of the flagship programs at Northland involve unmanned aircraft systems technology, UAS, also known as drones. Uh, we launched a UAS maintenance program over a decade ago now. Um, and since I've had a lot of other programs, a small UAS field service tech program, a geospatial program, and others that have been developed at the college. But the reason I, I focus there and I, I bring that up is because unmanned aircraft system drone technology, the emergence of the technology has really created a lot of fun and exciting opportunities to engage industry partners and led to a lot of service learning projects. Um, a great example, I take a step back almost eight years ago to standing on the side of a agricultural field looking out over a farm field with the agronomist at Northland, uh, Dr. Dave Grafstrom, and he was explaining it, it was right before harvest, the wheat was standing tall and the wheat was underseeded with perennial ryegrass. This year they'd take out the wheat crop, harvest the wheat, and it takes two years for perennial ryegrass to come to production. So that'll keep growing past this point into the next year and they'll harvest it for the seed. And it's a cool weather grass seed. And just to give a little perspective on the importance, it's a $40 million industry up in Roseau County, perennial ryegrass. The biggest town in Roseau County is the city of Roseau at a population of 2,800. So it is a, a big cash crop specialty crop in the area. And Dave's talking to me and, and drone technology at that point is fairly new. Um, I, Northland was among the first educational institutions to be integrating it. And we're having this conversation about the technology and Dave is asking me, do you think we could take these, this drone technology and fly over this field? And there's, if you look out there, there's the pesky weeds called um, wild oats that are out in the farm field. They built up a resistance to the herbicide. If you see them this year, they're gonna be there next year. If they're in the seed, when they harvest the perennial ryegrass, it's gonna decrease the quality of the seed, decrease the value of it. The grower gets less money, but there's, there's more heavy duty chemicals we could apply if we could get a map of this and know exactly where to spray. And I go, I don't know, but we got this industry partner down in Minneapolis, Sentara. They manufacture sensors, drone technology, and they've been talking about this new software that can generate these maps and these 3D maps and, and maybe 
we can generate a 3D map, identify those patches of wild oats. So I give the chief aerospace engineer a call, talk to him about it. He says, well, I don't know how about the density and the size differential and the different things that would have to be there to make that possible. But theoretically it is possible. So we go out there and fly the field and we get done flying and we start looking at the first images and realize we don't even need to do anything fancy in this magical 3D mapping and all that type of stuff. We can identify this weed that's out in the field and we can create a GPS map to plug into a farm vehicle and go spot spray. And it was amazing at that time. That's become very commonplace today. Um, but at the time we had no background on that. No one was doing that yet. Experimental in nature, just looking at the advancement of technology, thinking outside the box. And that led to getting out there and doing a lot of different presentations for commodity growers associations, different uh, farmers, growers to learn about the technology and get this out there. And this is actually a great segue into the first part of the presentation. Cassidy, if you can move to the next slide here. Um, we had Zach Nicklin lined up to talk about the Bowser project. Unfortunately, we, we had an unforeseen conflict come up. So I'm gonna step into that role and talk about the Bowser Ditch Assessment Project, Bowser being the Board of Water and Soil Resources, mm -hmm. which is a great project that resulted from some of that early drone work. Um, the Bowser Project, uh, Northland Community and Technical College is partnered with Pennington uh, County Soil and Water Conservation District Office and the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources to do an inventory of more than 50 ditches in Pennington County that flow into three different river systems, including the, uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, Bowser is the agency that oversees the SWCD, the Soil and Water Conservation District Office, and they're both responsible for improving and protecting the soil and water resources. And I think living in Minnesota, we can all recognize the, uh, the significant impact the, the, uh, the, that water quality has and recognize the societal impact as we look at things like the Mississippi River, the downward flow and maintaining quality water systems. Cassidy, if you can go to the next slide. So as a part of this project, um, they're looking at the, the mapping modeling we were able to do before. Uh, public institutions actually had an easier time applying the technology out in the field and conducting operations based on regulations and some of those things. So we had industry partners coming to the college to get expertise and access to the equipment to go out and apply it for projects like this. And their interest was in, in looking in Thief River, Pennington County, agriculture is a huge, huge industry. Um, looking at things like uh, sediment runoff from farm fields into the waterway, sediment piling in those areas, blockages that are caused by that sediment piling and beaver dams and down trees. And one of the high priority things was the um, soil erosion, looking at land erosion and the significant impact that that has to landowners, but also with that sediment flowing into the streams, the environmental impact that that has. Uh, Cassidy, if you can go to the next slide. So we dug into that partnership, really got an understanding of their needs, what they were after with this, and, and knew that we hadn't done this specific project, but we had the capability. So we met with, even before the technical aspects of it, we met with the county commissioners, because at that time, there was still uh, you know, a concern with drone technology. It was pretty new, so making sure that we we're good stewards and out in the community talking about the projects and letting people know what we we're doing met with the Board of Soil and Water Conservation District Office um, to talk about the capabilities that we did have um, to be able to go out, fly drone technology, map these areas, and um, investigate the, uh, the outputs or results that could be generated that would meet their needs. This partnership allowed us to, to really get a close connection with the industry partners, understand the technician needs, help the technicians in upskilling and integrating this technology into their operations, provided students with real world projects, which really creates that buy-in and, and connects to things like undergraduate research, which has become a bigger focus in two-year technical education, creating opportunities for students to engage in real world problems um, without defined solutions and really think outside the box as they apply what they're learning in the classroom to these type of situations. Um, so it enhances the learning opportunities, really creates some inspired learning and, and some amazing experiences for students. Cassidy, next slide. 
With that, um, it's really important as you engage industry partners that they understand um, the what to expect with engaging students in these projects, understand some of the capabilities and limitations that might exist as you look at things like scheduling key priority times throughout the semester where students are really available or not available and that changing uh, flexibility um, in these operations. And then just the outputs from this, when you, you look at this from a student project perspective, things happen, things don't always turn out the way that they, they were intended from the beginning of a project. So being able to create that understanding is really important, but in reality, like real world experience, sometimes failures really aren't the worst thing that can happen. Sometimes the failures, if it's still utilized as a, a lessons learned and students reporting out on what didn't work, why it didn't work, what were some of the limitations or the unforeseen things that, that happened throughout the life of the project, that can be just as valuable as a really successful outcome that, that met the initial expectations. But that was key and critical when we engaged industry partners to make sure we were having those conversations and, and creating that understanding of what this experimentation, integrating this into the classroom content and curriculum was gonna involve. Cassidy, next slide. And in, in the end, I think some of the biggest impacts really are to the student experience in getting involved in these projects, being able to make these deep connections that bring industry and workplace experience into the classroom and vice versa. So that student experience is probably the biggest impact that I see with this. I think industry being able to connect to the classroom and feeling like when they see what's going on, when they're engaged in this, that there's a lot of value in their input that we integrate directly into the course curriculum. Um, that's key and critical. In the case of the, uh, the drone mapping project, we were actually able to get, because we had easier access, we're a part of the state system, we already had insurance coverage liability and other UAS that we were maintaining and operating. It was easy for us to integrate this technology into our inventory industry partners had concern about some of the liabilities that existed. So through this partnership, we were able to bring in over $100,000 of equipment that became the training assets for the classroom um, and really maximize that utilization as it was used across student projects for faculty research and accessible to industry partners. So great as far as the resource enhancement, um, as far as student portfolio and experience, it's really awesome to be able to have students involved in these type of projects that give them an opportunity to um, have an experience that they can turn into a story when they're interviewing with employers and talking about their educational experience. It really ties to real world experiences of problem solving and uh, creates an opportunity to talk about a lot of fun and interesting things, both successes as well as the challenges that I've talked about. And then with, through the partnerships, um, we've had other companies like Northrop and General Atomics and others that have also provided equipment. They've, they've seen this investment into the educational programs and have uh, really been instrumental in providing equipment. But in some cases, they also, with uh, some of the large scale stuff that's still in operation, they'll come to the classroom and work hand in hand with the students, their engineers, as they retrofit and refurbish equipment to go out to the field and integrate in, into uh, operations again. Um, they, they come and they engage with the students in those type of activities that, again, really help to create some, some interesting and solid connection points. So a couple of examples uh, on the Northland front for service learning projects and that impact. And I, I really look forward to the other speakers hearing your, your experiences and stories and, and perspective. Thanks, Chris, so I'll turn it back to you. We really appreciate it, John, and the, the, the impacts at... Uh... At, at Northland Community and Technical College, specifically on the SUAV front are amazing. And you can hopefully start to see for the participants listening, you can hopefully start to see that some of the big enormous impacts, not just to the student, but to the school are, are available through service learning. We're gonna real quickly go over to our next presenter, which is Mike Sams. Mike is a faculty uh, of the Heavy Equipment Operations and Maintenance Program at Central Lakes College in Staples, Minnesota. And I've actually known Mike for a number of years now and used to work with him as well. And he did a really interesting path, uh, path 
program, a bike path program with his students, with the community. And uh, I'm not going to spoil it too much for you, Mike, uh, but I'm going to let Mike go ahead and take the, take, the, take the mic and talk about his project. Thank you, Chris. Um, this bike path uh, consists of about a mile and a half long. And uh, it there, this was probably one of the largest projects in recent history that Central Lakes College was able to participate in. Well, you know, we have a, a pile of challenges related to this project, uh, and I'll go through some of them as we go get further into it. But um, this was a project that the students did uh, the primary um, leading on, uh, all the way from doing a, the permitting process and going through a Gopher State One call to uh, locate all the buried utilities in that project. And, uh, uh, and th they were completely blown away uh, when they started to look at the ditch line uh, because the, the project, the bike path actually flowed right alongside uh, Wadena County Highway 2 and it uh, and and Highway 30, County Road 30. So we were working within those right of ways and those right of ways had every utility uh, to include um, uh, some very large power lines going through there and fiber optics and and gas services. And uh, so any kind of mistake that the stu students would have made in there could have uh, potentially created a big problem for a lot of us, but um, they got used to uh, uh, potholing and, and locating those utilities. They, they went from uh, moving the earth uh, and grading and borrow pit, and it, it was just a, a quite a large project. Um, the uh, scope basically of the project took us close to four years to get it completed. Um, we moved over 10,000 cubic yards of material in that uh, time frame. Um, we created a borrow pit, which expanded irrigation capa uh, capabilities and capacities for the, the research farm that's here at CLC. Uh, we had a fill site, which was close to half a mile away from the borrow pit. So we ended up having to run a, a separate crew there. And then our third crew was the grading crew and compaction crew, those guys um, um, being spread out a little bit required us to have the right students at the right time at the right place. And uh, some of those values that uh, uh, needed to get to them was like crew leadership skills because I couldn't be everywhere at one spot or at one time I should say, but I could trust certain students to get it done. So the bike path was 10 foot wide and it connected an existing trail uh, on the south side of the city of Staples to the north side of the city of Staples. And it ended up at Central Lakes College's uh, Legacy Gardens. So it was, uh, it was quite a feat to, to, uh, to accomplish. I, with a given crew of 20 journey people, it would have been uh, probably a very easy project to accomplish in a very short amount of time. But when you take 20 rookies, and according to, and you can see the slide and the size of equipment that we use, um, that that took a little bit of, uh, of skill, let's just say, to uh, keep those guys on on task and on track. In fact, the photo that's being shown right there, we were working with um, the Coke pipelines at that very spot, and we had uh, uh, site inspectors coming out to verify exactly what we were doing and the amount of weight we were exerting over top their three pipelines that were crossing that trail at that point. So we had input from industry partners um, as it comes to pipeline crossings and road crossings um, all the way along that route. Some of the challenges we had, uh, first off, we had to deal with the college. We had to get permission from the college to actually take our state owned equipment off college ground to create this bike path. And that in itself, as many people know, using state equipment off of property, state property can be an issue, but we did secure permission to get that accomplished. Uh, several years ago, uh, mid nineties, I was involved with uh, the National Guard when we were building the uh, Morrison County Fairgrounds. 
And since we were a state entity building a, uh, a project like that, um, there was a potential that contractors would have issue with it. And one did take issue with it, took us to court and we ended up having a cease and desist order um, and we had to remove all of our equipment. Well, we were very concerned that this might happen here. So we contacted all of our contractors in the area and uh, made some concessions. And as long as we uh, just did the dirt work and concentrated on building the path, they were okay with that. And in some cases, some of our students were hired basically completely off of that project because they were involved dealing with those contractors. The countywide, uh, the county uh, challenge was get, securing the right of way permitting. Uh, since we were actually uh, impacting two county roads and inside the uh, in slopes and uh, within the right of ways, the, the county was very easy to work with. However, uh, the students found out that politics you know, related to construction projects can be somewhat cumbersome from time to time. Uh, then we got into the city part of it. The city, the challenge came from the city for us to build that. Um, used to be that the college, when it was an AVTI, would do a lot of work for the local community. And since the state owns everything now, that ended up being another, another problem. And then the last one was the students had to convince the rest of our heavy equipment de uh, department faculty that they could do this. And there was a somewhat of an uphill challenge with that as most of our instructors at that time were not in favor of doing this project and we've had uh, um, some of those uh, instructors did not believe that we could complete it they didn't want us to have um, bad press if you will they didn't want us to have a black eye over a project started and not completed so students brought it in on time um, they had an estimated budget. They built an estimate for the project. And uh, by their numbers, they were extremely close and uh, very proud of how they got that completed. Uh, some of the, uh, you can change the slides, slide please. Some of the things that I found that while we did this project, uh, the students pride and workmanship um, was second to none. Normally these guys work in what we refer to as a sandbox, which is about a hundred acre site where the dirt has moved uh, maybe millions of miles, but yet only inches from where it's actually started. It's been flipped upside down so many times it never knows which way is up. They don't build a project and then they, we grade it and then they backfill it. Um, but this was a project that was going to last. This was a project that was going to stay. So those students, excelled at trying to make that project look the best it could, which they, you know, when we took them back to the, back onto the campus, their workmanship went right back down to what it was before, um, which was marginal in some cases. And, but these guys that were on that project really did, really did uh, do a good job. I always had problems. The college had problems. Our department has problems uh, with getting students on time to class. These guys would come early. They were ready to do the work. They were excited to do the work and we would do a, a risk assessment before the project. So everybody would have an idea of what was going on. It worked out great. And still today we run into some of these students and they, uh, they ask if that project was completed and they ask if how it looks. And so it's something that lasts with uh, <laughs> Chris sent me a one minute warning and Cassidy just sent me five minute warning. So I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to work with, but I was wrapping it up, Chris. So, um, so anyways, we do have students out there. There comes my next picture. We do have students that were hired directly off the project. We had the interview day while that project was going on. The students were able to take the contractors representatives right out to the actual site and show them their workmanship and, uh, we currently have two, two students that have progressed from that project that are foremen or higher with, uh, within, that, within a couple different companies. So, so anyways, the long story short, it was an outstanding project. 
I would do it again in a heartbeat. And uh, um, if it wasn't so cumbersome to get the state to allow us to work off campus, uh, I think it would be a lot better. So I'll wrap that up. Thanks, Mike. Well, you know, getting students employed is such, uh, and getting them motivated is such a big deal with service learning. And it's things that just can't happen in a regular classroom. So uh, congratulations on that work, Mike. And I personally know that project pretty well. And, and I've been on that path once or twice myself. And uh, it's just great to be able to see the students uh, get that tremendous value from those experiences. So appreciate it. Coming up next is Dennis Courtney from Streamworks. And uh, Dennis has a really interesting kind of, a, again, a different twist. The, the great part about this webinar presentation is that we have a lot of different twists on service learning, uh, some directly more traditional uh, transportation programs and some of them with what the, the drone program. So Dennis, without further ado, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you guys for having me. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So Streamworks, we started Streamworks in a partnership with Eastman Chemical Company approximately four or five years ago. And uh, since then we've grown in pri primarily in the Southeast United States. What makes us interesting and what makes our mission interesting is we want to serve our communities for that 21st century workforce development piece. And what's, what's cool about it is uh, what we discovered over the years is we would take kids, uh, primarily high school students, and give them an opportunity to um, come in and work, you know, for our summer camps. And so we've kind of drilled down. We've done everything from, you know, when the pandemic hit last year, we were doing uh, at-home kits. We would mail out kits for STEM kits so that kids could join us virtually. But we've really uh, tried to drill that down to our two main uh, premier pro uh, programs, MATE, our partnership with Marine Advanced Technology Education, Underwater ROVs, and Robot Drone League, which is played on a field of you know, about the size of a tennis court with nets. It was actually uh, developed at Florida Atlantic University down in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and we just, we think that, you know, you give a kid a robot and a drone or an underwater ROV and get out of their way and turn them loose, give them the resources that they need. Uh, they'll discover how important math and science are and so that's that's kind of our that's kind of our niche but uh, we discovered too that there was a, a high demand for our summer camps and for our programs and so we had to have some help and we turned to our our leadership kids on these robotics teams and we discovered that they were getting much more out of this experience than we originally anticipated and you know of course we pay them 10 bucks an hour which we offset that through camp registrations but what we've seen is first generation kids that you know probably weren't headed to post-secondary education not only are they headed there they're uh, thriving they're getting scholarships you know uh, we've got two that are at east tennessee state university on full ride scholarships uh you, in there in that picture, we've got Quentin Faulkner, who is one of those. He's also our CMATE store manager. So, uh, and then another one is Connor uh, Golden, who is at BYU currently. Um, then we have a young lady, next slide, please. Uh, we have a young lady that's headed to um, uh, the Air Force Academy. So uh, we, it was kind of a, a, a pleasant and uh, just a, a blessing uh, that these kind of things happen for our kids. And so that's what we're real excited. And we appreciate you guys uh, inviting us here for this service learner um, uh, uh, presentation because we think that we've kind of dialed that in over the past three or four years. Of course, COVID just kind of interrupted right in the middle of the flow. And I'm actually headed to Tennessee now. I live in Georgia, but I'm headed to Tennessee for our underwater robotics competition, uh, which you see right there in the picture. Um, uh, Part of our internship program is we'll go up to about 40 interns per summer and in the past we've only had our camps in northeast tennessee uh, this summer we're planning on three locations virginia tennessee and georgia uh, so we'll probably have about 1500 participants come through our camps our camps are not meant to be uh, you know mastery skill set learning uh, experiences but more about that um, hey this is how we see the uh, the kids springboarding into these different initiatives. And so if you look at the statistics, which um, you guys probably know these stats, 
is that 75% 75 of kids that are involved in extracurricular STEM activities will go on to some kind of post-secondary education. It's in, you know, and if you look at the uh, worldwide results now with um, how, how we rank as a country in science and math, we have to do something. We have to help our communities and our school systems and our industry. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, and as I, you know, that's some of our key success factors is we recruit students from robotics teams that have that experience. They can show students how to program a Raspberry Pi or to drop some code into a robot or, you know, give, give a, a brief presentation on the aerodynamics, which, you know, that helps these kids, these intern, these service learners prepare for, you know, uh, presentations that they'll have to give to get into the U.S. Air Force Academy or to go before a college selection board to get a scholarship. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, one th we, we do a, a lot of deliberate training with our interns, with our service learners. Uh, we have, we're actually going through a six week process where the, the new interns coming in for the summer have to go through a two hour per two hours per week uh, virtual training with our senior interns. Uh, I believe that, you know, our junior interns could probably learn a lot more from a 25 year old intern that's gone through the process the last three or four years than a 56 year old director that's probably going to retired Navy guy, me, <laughs> you know, that's probably going to come at it from a different perspective. But we always tell them that, you know, the STEM mission comes above everything else, that these kids that are sitting there either soldering or working on coding or computer, they come first. And so our interns do a really good job. They're not sitting around on their cell phones. Uh, their attention is like a teacher in a classroom. And so that's what kind of makes it unique. Next slide, please. Um, you know, and it's all about the mission. It's about these kids. And this is one of the first kids that ever went through our program. And, you know, that's his grandmother in the background. And um, I might get a little, you know, my voice might get a little emotional about this. But, you know, these kids, um, th this kid right here, in, in particular, Brendan Farmer, you know, he lived in a two bedroom apartment with four females and didn't have a male influence in his life. But you know what, and because of robotics and because of Streamworks and coming through and, and working his way, working hard, he got into Georgia Tech and he's already graduated. So he's well on his way to a successful career. And, you know, do we want all these kids to go to a four-year college? Absolutely not. That's not what it's about. It's about finding their niche, whether it's post-secondary, two-year uh, a two-year college or a two-year tech school, or maybe it's, you know, getting some kind of certification through Google uh, you know, in computer science, you know, it's all about, you know, the education and becoming that lifelong learner. And so that's why we think our internship program uh, you know, is, is pretty vibrant. And, uh, and again, I'm open for questions. I, I believe that I don't think I have any other slides, but thank you for allowing me to uh, present today. And I appreciate you. Any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. That was such a great presentation and your project. The impact on the students is just just amazing. And we do have time, folks that are listening. We do have time after our next presenter for a little Q&A as well. So thank you again, Dennis. That was really great. Uh, our next presenter is Tim Brandon. And Tim is an auto body collision repair technology instructor at Lake Superior College in Duluth, Minnesota, in the far northeast of our state. And uh, Tim, I've known Tim for a number of years, and he obviously has a, a really big community niche to him and his project. And so without further ado, Tim, take yourself off mute, and you can go ahead and talk about your 76 Laguna. Okay. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, well, we had the opportunity to do uh, last year, um, pre-COVID was the majority of it. Um, was to partner with uh, a local auto group, um, Ben Ford and Superior, uh, the owner Pat Ringgold every year uh, takes a vehicle that's donated, um, pays to have it uh, redone at local shops through donations and some of his own money. And he'll display it on the showroom floor uh, for about four months. And then there will be a public auction um, and that money directly will go to the Purple Heart veterans group that's here locally. 
Um, in the past, body shops and mechanic shops would try to donate time and get things uh, done together as a group. Um, we were contacted when the shops were basically just too busy. They, they didn't have time. Um, anyone in the automotive field, as far as collision repair or even automotive, uh, trying to do a complete car takes a significant amount of time and manpower. Um, so we, we talked with the students, um, well, I talked to the students and they said they were all on board and uh, we brought it in. And if you go back the one slide by chance, that's kind of the beginning stages. It was a, a 1976 Chevy Laguna. It came from Western United States. So it actually was fairly solid, but pretty much the entire car had to be gutted, uh, repainted and put back together. Um, so we can go back forward one slide. Um, the goal in the beginning was it's a charity auction. So even though say a vehicle is worth $8,000 on the street, there's times that these vehicles can bring $16,000, $20,000 um, through that charity type auction. Um, the prior vehicle was a Chevy truck um, and it had brought like twelve dollars to $14,000. And it was maybe only a $7,000 Chevy truck at that time, but they had, they had it redone and it was auctioned. Um, and then I believe the person who bought that truck through the auction actually gave it right back and let them sell it um, to raise even more money for the Purple Heart. So um, that was uh, the prior project. So we, we brought it in. Um, it came in around Christmas time or Christmas break. We're only a one-year program. So we basically had one semester to try to get all this done. Um, but Pat Ringgold was an excellent partner. Um, and that's one thing to comment on is having a good solid industry partner. Um, it was great to have a person involved that, um, granted he was happy that, I mean, we only charge for supplies so that that, that was a, a benefit to him. Um, but being able to have answers uh, immediately to, to move forward was excellent. Um, he came up with the idea that we should try to replicate. Um, some people in the room are old enough to remember um, Yale Carl, I'm gonna pronounce the name wrong, Carl Burrow uh, drove a 1976 Laguna in NASCAR. It was red and white. And the goal was actually to replicate that car the best we could and actually have it stickered up and everything. Unfortunately, the car didn't get stickered up um, through some legal reasons. <laughs> and, uh, but the cars got painted this, the, the paint scheme, so that's a positive. So let's go ahead and one slide. Um, here's a student uh, getting ready to jam the doors. Um, again, our, our outside partner um, and the Purple Hearts were willing to trust that we could get it done because if we did not get it done, they did not have a, our auction that year and they, they lose out on all that money. So it really helps the, the Purple Heart group. I believe there's still 15 members of this group. So unfortunately, every year they, they may or may not lose a member and the, the, the size gets smaller. But um, and then, of course, having the outside partner display the vehicle in his auto dealership showroom for about two months, um, not to mention he's on the radio about three times a week and was talking about it constantly. So as far as uh, schools and programs go, um, a lot of teachers can sometimes uh, maybe express some frustration with trying to promote their program um, or getting people to promote it. Um, this was, I mean, the amount of free airtime and everything we got as a benefit was more than worth the time invested. Um, I have students attending this year that actually had gone to the website and looked at the car and heard about the college through this. Um, we were supposed to do another one this year, but unfortunately the vehicle that was donated um, was a little rougher than everybody anticipated. And we, we unfortunately had to back out on the one this year. Um, and they're kind of scrambling to try to find a different car to just maybe auction. Um, so we're hoping to do another one next year. Um, and of course, the students, if the students don't do it, um, we're in trouble also. Um, so we had some, a few very good students. Uh, the student in this photo is actually employed at a local body shop uh, right out of school. Um, so this experience, again, uh, really did help him get employed. Um, he, had, he actually was a big part of this car um, and his experience on it was one of the deciding factors for him to actually get offered the job at the shop he's at. Uh, so we could go forward one more slide. Um, so the car originally was black. And as we can see, um, this is at least in the paint booth, um, it got two-tone white and red. Um, and the joke was when the car was done, actually everybody who saw the car when it was done 
uh, made a lot of comments that the car never wanted to be black in the first place. So uh, the new paint job really did make the car look significantly more appealing um, and, and went well. Um, and I guess this slide I had progress matters. I'm trying to remember I had a really good spiel for every slide, but I'm, I'm falling apart a little bit. But, um, but basically the progress, uh, the students did a timeline. I would say that we stuck to that timeline pretty well. I mean, we did succeed and we did get it done in the three months that we had to get it done. Um, and let's see what the next slide is. And that, that is an example of what we were trying to replicate. That was Haley Oberos 1976 Laguna. Um, so we did do the paint scheme, but it never did get lettered. Um, and again, the lessons learned, uh, we needed the proper partner, which we found and that partnership should continue into the future uh, as we find more donations every year for that Purple Heart group. Um, the other thing that was great is uh, because of there was so much media involved on the auction day that students were able to go to that, that dealership and actually one was interviewed for, uh, they're on the TV that night on the news. And so it really was a, a, a big push for the program at no expense to the college, um, which was excellent. And that proper partner, um, you know, he took care of all that basically. I mean, he, he, he did the radio stuff, he did, brought the TV stations in. So there was no real us having to get the school involved to get the school to get the TV station there. Uh, it was just an excellent partner. Um, he, he's stellar at this. Um, students can't be forced to work on it. Um, in the end, everybody had a hand in the car, but in the end, a few had most of the progress on the car. Um, what that basically meant is as a teacher, you can keep forcing them to try to work on something they don't want to work on, but in the end, if they don't want to work on it, um, it affects everybody. So the team did dwindle down to uh, choice three or four in the end, uh, but they did an excellent job. And that payoff again went to them being employed in multiple places. Um, the time frame is very short. There's not a lot we could do about that, but it's definitely a lesson learned. Uh, we typically do this year. We have six completes. Um, so in that in the year that they're here, they start with nothing, and then they finish up their personal projects completes. And then we do typically about a dozen to fifteen customer projects that are more collision related. Um, and same, the instructor needs to be prepared. Um, again, all the stress is typically on the instructor or the person doing the project as, as I'm sure with the, the prior instructor and prior instructor that talked about doing that, the dirt trail and everything. I can, I can just imagine <laughs> the stress that had to be involved with all that, plus all the setting up. So I, I have to give him extreme kudos, but uh, I think that's the last slide. Oh, there you go. So there it is on the showroom floor. Um, and that was their ad on their website for the auction. Um, so the, and in the end, uh, yeah, so our goal was eight to 9,000. In the end, the car brought, I believe it was $14,750. Um, so it was more than we all expected. Um, it turned out great for that veteran group because the car was donated and the supplies to paint it ended up being about $2,800. So, um, a good chunk of change went to the Purple Hearts, about 12,000 or so. Um, and, and again, increased visibility for the program. Uh, the students were able to attend the auction and uh, it directly benefited, benefited the Purple Heart Association. Um, so yeah, it was a great project. I hope to do more in the future and the students did enjoy it and uh, it was great all around. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Well, that was, uh, I, got, I got to tell you, that was just an amazing project, too. I, I, I don't think that any of our uh, uh, folks that had presented today had, had anything less than stellar and amazing projects. So, so once again, a, a big thank you to uh, John Beckerfield and for Zach Nicklin, uh, Mike Sams, Dennis Courtney, and Tim Brandon. Uh, we, we are very thankful for being able to present, and we hope that this is a good opportunity for you as well. If you notice, there were a lot of common themes there, right? Student pride, self-confidence, students getting jobs, opportunities in the real world, uh, connect their learning, a deeper impression of their learning, an understanding of maybe the why are they doing things. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It was just, a, they're all such great experiences. You know, and for, for those of you that are listening, and this is a recording, 
if you want to start your own service learning, there's a lot of really amazing things and ways to do this. And uh, I mean, on the screen, you'll see that there's a couple of funding opportunities uh, that we can talk about. And at this particular moment in time, John, John Beck does have some closing remarks and next steps, which include some of the funding. But I'd like to be able to do and just open it up to an open mic. And you can put something in the chat at this point, or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. We can do a little bit of Q&A. We've still got some time to do some Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead, unmute yourself, type it in the uh, chat bar. Everybody doesn't have to jump on it. <laughs> no, I, I think I'd uh, piggyback on uh, what Chris was saying there. I mean, that you can see those themes coming out, very different projects, very different uh, uh, considerations and dynamics with some of them, but, but great overarching themes. I think the community aspect of it, being able to really foster a, a community culture environment that that is bridged between education and industry is just powerful and, and such a benefit and value to society and, and everyone as a whole that's involved with these type of projects. I think the ownership that's created um, in these projects really, it, it provides an enhancement to the student learning environments and, and what they're getting out of it and how they apply their technical skills that they're learning in the, the classroom into these projects. And I, I think that also, again, reinforces kind of the industry perspective of seeing what the students are are doing, how they're engaged and, and create some great opportunities. I know that the jobs uh, transition was something that a lot of the, the speakers here had talked about today. And I know we've had that with the Bowser project where we initially brought on students as contractors to support that work during the summer times and after graduation that led to employment opportunities. Um, so I think those are all super, super beneficial things. And then I think a big takeaway or, or kind of next step from this, this group is just that continued conversation on these fronts. There's also things like challenges. And I appreciate Mike talking about some of the different dynamics with getting out in the community and being able to bring equipment out for these community projects. There's sometimes some administrative challenges, logistics, um, processes, procedures that, that you have to navigate. Drone technology has been a huge one where we field questions all day long from across the Minnesota system as well as the nation as educators are looking at some of the things that, that are involved in that. Um, so being able to get the conversation going about service learning opportunities, identifying the benefits, but also identifying the challenges and having networks that can help navigate through some of that based on previous experience, that's that's one of the big takeaways for me. And next steps uh, is really just keeping the conversation going and, and getting the feedback. So with that, I'll, I'll pause. If there's anyone else jumping in here on, on any thoughts or perspectives you've got from your institutions or, or questions you'd like to ask. We do have a question from Mike Schmel down in Rochester. Who's the driver of the project? Mike, and I assume you're not talking about the vehicle driver or the uh, Bobcat skid steer driver um, or, or the drone driver. You know, the driver of the project, I'm kidding, Mike. Uh, the driver of the project really is, is uh, you know, it, it kind of sort of in many cases. Now, it, it doesn't have to be this way, Mike, but and, and it does definitely lie on the educator. And now the educator, I'm using that word in a general sense, teacher, administrator, Perkins person, coordinator, CT coordinator, uh, you know, there's, there's different people who drive it in different situations. And the, the local setting does change a lot. Sometimes the teacher is the person who's in the driver's seat, other times it's some type of coordinator or something. Um, Dennis and Tim uh, and, and John, maybe do you have any answers to that a little bit more uh, of who the driver is? Uh, I think you just, you know, I think it's um, your your director and your community and those partnerships that you can establish. And if you have a consensus and that willingness, uh, you know, the champion's going to develop themselves, whether it's a teacher 
or director or maybe you know, someone within the industry that uh, really wants to champion that with youth. And uh, so I think it's, um, yeah, it's, they're, they're hard to come by. I'm not going <laughs> to, sugar, no sugar coating it for sure. Um, but you, you've got to find those people in the community that really have a passion for, um, you know, driving something with youth and it has to be uh, something in the extracurricular field or, or those projects. I think having that common mission theme, like, uh, you know, you're doing something really cool for the community, like your pathways and your roads and, you know, summer camps. I think you just have to find that champion and let them develop themselves and give them that opportunity and, and, and put a lot of support behind them to really get uh, success. And uh, that's where bringing in your industry partners and, and your community leadership uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's always evolving. So you gotta be willing to, uh, even grow from there. And, you know, this is a part of that. So again, uh, just, you know, kind of expanding past your boundaries of, um, you know, how this looks and what, and sharing of knowledge, you know, we've got to share, you know, I try to teach the kids at these robotics competition, you know, this is not a football game. Uh, you know, football, we're not going to discover what the other team, their, their plays, we don't know what their playbook looks like, but we have to know what our playbook looks like when we're talking about these service learner projects. And so I think, you know, that sharing of knowledge and best practices, uh, it pays off in huge dividends for all of us. So again, that's kind of my perspective on who the driver is and it's us. Yeah, I really like that really like that uh, response. I mean, it is finding those initial champions to get the ball rolling on some of this. And I think the network helps to keep that passion level up. And it really does take a lot of people who begin engaging. But as these things launch and as activities um, start rolling, I, I think they are self-serving for the initial intent and the direction of them as um, Dennis was talking about, really inspiring students become inspired as they engage in these type of activities and they become the driver in it eventually. It takes that early champion with a vision to get things rolling, but the drivers really, really uh, are a result of the project as well to keep that going and building momentum and, and coming up with new and creative ways to really expand and, and continue growing the robust nature of these and the community impact and um, the experiences that result. Hey Tim, who uh, who came? Whose idea was it initially, or who originated the idea for your Chevy and your auto body program? Actually, an excellent question. I, I don't remember how it all came about. Um, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but like just kind of occurred. But I, I honestly don't remember the exact moment that we knew they needed help or. Someone must have reached out to me, I'm sure. Um, so I'm assuming like Pat Ringel did initiate that. My assumption is he called and I called him back and then next thing you know, the car was here. Um, I know that we weren't actively like trying to search it out. We didn't even know something like that existed. So I would assume that, that Pat Ringel reached out. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I did spend some time with Mike, Sam, Mike is uh, no longer on the phone with us. He had to actually go back to class, <laughs> but um, he was teaching. But uh, I actually was uh, working with Mike Sams when uh, his project at Central Lakes College at the Bike Path started. And I, I think Mike would say that just having the setting where it's an op uh, the ability to have the open conversation about things and having that setting within his advisory committee, uh, that openness and that ability for kind of that comfort zone for those in industry to be able to just talk about things and just talk about things that are coming up, potential areas for student engagement, and just having that open conversation or that, uh, that atmosphere that can be informal at an advisory committee and creating that value that we can deliver as educators would be what Mike's response would be. So the answer, Mike, is not necessarily do you have to wait for the community to come to you with an idea. Sometimes they don't even know that they have a great idea or that they have a project, but having that open and inclusive advisory committee or communication channels outside of advisory committees 
Sometimes uh, teachers or coordinators or administrators sit on various boards or groups within the community, like, you know, uh, if you have a uh, Rotary or a Chamber of Commerce or uh, some other type of organization, even the Boy Scouts of America or those Girl Scouts of America or something like that, um, even people that sit on the city, oftentimes there's just informal conversation, but it's having that openness and willingness to listen and be a part of a conversation is a big part of it. That was a good question, Mike. Any others? Yeah, you're right. You're right, Mike Schnell. There is a lot of equipment needed for these amazing projects. And so it's actually, Mike, uh, It's a, your timing couldn't be any better. Mike, I think uh, we're, we're going to use your question to transition to um, our next part, which is funding opportunities. And John Beck has kind of some thoughts about the funding opportunities. Um, we've got them up on the screen. And John, you can go ahead and uh, talk about some of these different funding opportunities. Yeah, so as I talked about, the, the principal funding for the, the National Center for Autonomous Technologies right now is through the NSF AT program, which is focused on technical education led by two-year two -year faculty, but a big part of that is always the, uh, the educational pathways and partnering with high schools. We've got a lot of work on those fronts, and we've got the ability to, uh, to help provide resources for other institutions who are interested in launching projects, if that's seed funding, that's going to help establish additional models for others to be able to integrate those type of projects or resources. So definitely on that front, um, feel free if you have ideas. And I know Chris with the Transportation Center of Excellence um, is, is also able to, uh, to help out with some of this work. If you've got ideas, we love to hear about that, whether it's the existing resources that we are able to apply towards that, or I know um, there's there's different folks on the line today, including Chris, who's involved with things like the Perkins funding. And a lot of times that, that, uh, that type of funding, collaborative projects across different institutions, um, and specifically not reinventing the wheel, leveraging some of the best practices, the stories that, that you're hearing today are great ways to approach those type of funding sources, um, but we'll be working on pulling together uh, inventory of different resources and again, looking for this community and this conversation to help uncover some of those different opportunities that we can continue sharing out both on the website as well as um, in follow up information based on the types of correspondence that you got uh, to get you here today. And. Uh... The Transportation Center of Excellence, for those of you that are in Minnesota, or the National Center for Autonomous Technology, which is a national center that we are partnered with, um, you know, there's, a, there, there's so many different funding opportunities out there for projects like this. We are more, like John said, we are more than happy if you give us a call, send us an email, text, chat us, whatever it is, because we can be able to consult with you about how to do this, what to do it. Um, I think that there's, there's, there's no single source for service learning. There are multiple sources for service learning, multiple, multiple, multiple services, meaning in some situations, Perkins might actually be the best way to go for it. In some areas, it might be a larger thing that you want to do something with the National Science Foundation. There are other grants too, by the way, um, and, and keep in mind that actually, uh, I think, uh, at least 50%, I'm not 100% sure here, but I know at least 50% of the people that presented today didn't have a grant. It didn't have Perkins funding that subsidized any of this. It was all industry partner or community-based organizations. So, uh, you know, we don't always have to think we must have a grant. We must have something from Perkins in order to do the work. A lot of times, and, and at least 50% of the time, if not more, we can go to our industry partners and our community-based organizations to make things work. Um, and so, so we, we are definitely on board. Make sure you give us a call or an email. We do have um, a presentation, of, of, a PDF of this presentation is going to be sent out on email to those that were registered for this. And we are going to post this on our YouTube channel. And if you go to our website, which is mintran, M-I-N-N-T-R-A-N.org, uh, we'll, you can find our YouTube channel through the links and stuff there. 
um, we'll, we will send a PDF out. And if you look in the chat area, we do have a survey that we would love for you to take to see how we did today. Um, and again, that's in the chat. It's, uh, it says Qualtrics in it, so you can see exactly what that is. And we have everybody's email on here as well. Are there any other questions? Well, hearing, uh, hearing none, I do see a lot of you on there that I know. Uh, so for those of you that I know personally, I'd like to say thanks. And I'd also like to say thanks to, you, to you, those of you that I don't know or I haven't reached out to yet. And um, service learning, I think, I think you've heard over the last hour how incredibly powerful it is for the student. And that's why we do what we do. It's what wakes us up in the morning. It's what gets me going. I need coffee, but I also need to know to get me in the going in the morning, but I also need to know then I'm making a difference. And I know that every one of you wakes up in the morning knowing that you're gonna make a difference in somebody's life, specifically a student. And that's what service learning is. It enhances your curriculum, it enhances your education, it enhances you as a teacher, and it engages your industry and community and college partners as well. Um, I, I think even you know when we talk about even in recruiting, marketing, outreach, and enrollment, we heard about the examples from Tim Brandon about how much enrollment and attention to his program we've seen just from these top types of opportunities, plus the student outcomes, the jobs, all sorts of things. I, I can't find a single bad thing to say about service learning, except that it might be a little extra bit of work. But if you're on this call, you're probably used to a little bit extra bit of work that's maybe self-induced. Um, so again, Thank you to everybody that was on the phone. We hope that you have a happy rest of your day. Spring is right around the corner. And for those of you that are going to watch this later on in YouTube, uh, just an FYI, it was 62 degrees out and sunny when we, when we filmed this. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.